team. Are you part of BCCI? The body of Christ. See, no one wants to be part of you. The body of Christ. Not even him. So you are going to break your promise. You're going to break your promise. You said after them you're going to talk to me. And you never mentioned about Hatun. So are you going to keep your promise? No, but we are all part of the same team. Same team? We're all part of the same okay, team. Okay, I can talk to one person, not a team. Yeah, yeah, one more speaker at a time. Are you going to talk to me or not? I can also. How many do you need? No, no, are you going to? I can talk to one person at a time. Can you talk to me or not? Would you respect her too? I will respect her if she respects me. Can she? Of course she respects me. Okay, can you please apologize to me? If I tell her, if I tell her I don't want to talk to her. If I tell her I don't want to talk to her. That's very uncivil. No, it's not uncivil. I have the right. In this civilization, you have a right not to talk to someone if you don't want to. It's called the freedom of expression. Hashem, I'm not saying you have no answer. I'm not saying you don't have a right to refuse. I'm just saying it is uncivil. My material is here, sir. You can't tell me. Okay, where did you get this from? Please leave your camera. Please you. Okay, anyway. Please you leave your material from my camera. Leave your material from my camera. You can't take it there. Please you block in my camera. Show yourself you are a human because you are animal. Because you are animal, not understand. That what your God teach you. Is that what your God teach you to be an animal? You said after that. Not talk to me. Not talk to me. I'm not talking to you. Are you talking to you? I'm going to. Before that, we are gentlemen. Just let me speak. No, no, no. Only talk to me. Why talk to me? Because you are a problem. 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 Because
tells you that I don't want to talk huh? to you, Somebody will you still oh. insist on talking to that person? Which you did, which I'm fine with. With you, with you, with you. Hey, when I was speaking to the Jewish young people, you came and, I and stopped you... after you told me. Did I not? No, I you came to them. You even wanted to have a. Okay, why you went to them and I'm talking about Hatun? When I've told My clearly to Hatun, I don't want to talk Hashem. to her. It's simple. My point is. While I did the same thing to you, yeah. when you did not respect my request to you, I was fine with that. No, I stopped. I you stopped. Did not, yes, you I wanted did. to continue That's, the conversation. It's actually on camera that I stopped and Please. I was listening to them. By all means, yes. go but anyway, back to the rec but, but, recording. But the important thing is this. If somebody tells you yes, that they don't want to talk to you, will a civil person wave a page in your face? You see, this is the point I'm trying to tell you. Well, waving, you are very unfair when you touch Christian. Waving something, I don't know how that makes the conversation uncivil. I'm not sure. So you're saying waving something on somebody's face is not a Showing her back in front of her. Oh, in that so after, after I've insisted on talking to If Pep was showing up before you, was okay. Anyway, okay. anyway I, think, I think we'll let the, let the people judge. And that if somebody tells you, I don't, want to talk to you, I don't want to talk to you, then you should respect their wishes. And if somebody, especially not the one on the ladder, Hashem, no problem. Yeah, we can continue with our conversation. Good. I really think Good. because we have disagreements, we really need to engage in things we differ about. Very surely, I agree with that. But I only ask you. This is a request. I only ask you to treat my fellow Christians in similar ways. That's my only request. Yeah. Now, if, if you want to go against my request, that is fine too. You know, you can request. That's fine. But it's also my. You can refuse. It's also my freedom. I'm not talking it's about also freedom my, here. No, no, right. it is. I'm talking about freedom. It's my freedom to whom I wish to speak and to whom I wish not to speak to. And as a gentleman, if you, if you and I want to deal as a gentleman. Then you should also respect my wishes. No, that's fine. Okay, good. If you, so if I don't want to speak to your dear friend called Hatun, then you should respect the freedom of mine. Yeah. Good. If, if so now you have settled that. If ultimately, let's with the, if ultimately you only want to fall back on the bare minimum freedom and uh, rights. No, well, I can only say this is very, very sad. Well, it's sad I'd for like, you, but I think in this, because I'd like if to you're living in a, no, if you're living in a civilization, no, then you should respect those things as a bad I'm minimum. Quite, I'm quite happy to have a much higher. Yes. Let's say uh, agreement much higher. Even though you deny my rights, I'm still all right because I'd like to be a gentleman here. I denied Gentleness. your rights. What rights have I denied of yours? I'm sure you broke a few rules of the uh, few bylaws of Speaker's Corner when you did what you did. And I did what? Which no bylaw did I break? Well, you'll now get you'll stood here. So the guy who said I can overgo this and that now he's part of our bylaws. I said no. So, okay, anyway, shall we? You wanted to speak about. So, I have made my points. It's all on recording. You can check it out for that's, yourself. That's fine. Good. That's fine. Yeah. I also well made my, my point, and let's respect each other with regards to if somebody doesn't want to talk to you. What is next? Okay. Okay. So, now let's talk about the topic that you were talking about. As a, as a Muslim, I do not believe that anyone requires, as far as my faith is concerned, God, Allah doesn't require any blood sacrifice other than of an animal or a human being. As a Christian, do you believe that the only way to salvation after the coming of Jesus is through the human sacrifice of Jesus? Can you have any other way of salvation besides this human sacrifice? In terms of eternal redemption, there needs to be a penalty which is paid for my sins, which is commensurate with the rewards, which is eternity with God. And that is only possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God, prior to allowing that particular human sacrifice, also foreshadowed that pattern through all sorts of other sacrifices. But scriptures makes it quite clear that the other patterns were all temporary and had no lasting effect. Only in Jesus Christ, we have an eternal redemption for human beings. So in other words, no, you don't. The only way is through human sacrifice of Jesus. For eternal redemption, yes. Yeah, that's what I meant. So, you know, so God requires a payment by blood and there is no concept of forgiveness in Christianity. There is a concept of forgiveness without the payment of blood. When you ask a question, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm just clarifying the question. When you ask, I might know already. So, so let me answer and then you can ask on that. So, 
So your point somehow makes it makes uh, uh, sacrifice as a mutually uh, different, mutually exclusive agent to salvation, which is not the point I made. For eternal redemption, repentance is required from the, from the human beings side. Repentance is required. Sacrifice in the person of Jesus Christ for eternal value is required. And from God's side, based on these two legal provisions, forgiveness is required. So, let's say you, you ask God for forgiveness and you repent to God. Are those adequate or is human sacrifice mandatory? Now those are not adequate to deal with the legal problem that we, are, we, we human beings are so not asked. That, that was basically my question, which let me repeat what I said. All are required. If you do not have the concept of forgiveness, and to me forgiveness means not to ask something in return. No, no payment. That, that's a very strange definition of forgiveness. Let me give you mine, you give me yours. And then we'll see if it's Let's with the English. Well, it is in English. It is English, don't you worry. So, for example, if you had a debt, you owe the bank X number of money, X amount of money, and the bank requires you to pay it back. Now, that is called a payment. Yes, in kind, in this case, monetary payment. Yes? The bank might tell you that, okay, because you might not have money, you might take a payment in kind. Maybe your house is mortgaged, I don't know what. So, this is called debt, and you have to pay back something. You, if the bank tells you, okay, we don't require money from you and we don't require a debt from you, in sorry, we don't require payment of debt in the form of either material like your house or something else, yes, so we are going to pardon your debt, abolish your debt. Now that is called forgiveness. Now if you think otherwise, please give me your definition of forgiveness. Banks also get surety, could get surety from third parties. Not the one who is borrowing. If the borrower fails to pay back, they can go back to the one who provided surety and require the repayment from him. Exactly, that's that, the payment. And that would be payment from the third party, but forgiveness to the first party. Okay, so it's still payment. You still require payment, right? That is payment from the one who gave the guarantee. The guarantee. But it is forgiveness to the one who actually was the beneficiary of the borrowed funds. I forgive you because this guy wants to pay okay so it's substitution of payment from somebody else and so I forgive you okay. because this one wants to pay. all right so at the end of the day someone had to pay you see what I mean for example you're forgiven because Jesus paid for it right and that payment was only by blood and only by human sacrifice so that's what I'm saying at the end of the day there was still someone who had to pay for it so that is the point I'm going to make Forgiveness requires no payment at all. I it's gave you an example of forgiveness which requires a payment from the third party. That's what I'm saying. Somebody so at the end... you saying forgiveness does not require no, payment. No, no, no. For me, forgiveness requires no payment from anyone. Bank, when it goes back to the guarantor... I know what you said third time. They can get the funds from here, so the payment is still made. My friend, I know what you said. This is the third time. And forgiveness is also provided. Yes. So, when you say forgiveness, with payment, it's very different from forgiveness without payment. So for example, one of the names of Allah is Al Ghafur or Rahim. Right? These are the two names, Ghafur and Rahim. So Ghafur means he's the all forgiving and Al Rahim means the merciful. So he forgives and by his mercy. And this is what I'm saying. Not requiring payment by, by third person or a fourth person or anyone. He's able, Allah is able to forgive without any payment from any second, third, fourth person, anyone. Now, that concept seems to be missing in Christianity because as you have made it very clear, the only way you can actually redeem your sin is by the payment, by the human sacrifice, by the spilling of blood of a human being. You, especially in the last lecture, you said something which is revealed in the Quran is missing in the Bible. You made that point. Very interesting. But can I please suggest to you a very crucial add-on to that point, and then we'll clarify this. The point is this. 
when we have an original, the first of all the prophets, and then a photocopy which comes later, the last of prophets according to you. You don't go with the last to make the point about the pattern of forgiveness, but you rather go to the first few or the first many. In other words, when you see the Bible disagreeing with the Quran in regards to the sacrifices, your point of saying Quran's Allah is missing in the Bible, I agree with. I've always made this point. Christians never confuse the Allah of the Quran with the Allah of the Bible. And therefore, Allah of the Quran is certainly missing in the Bible. I agree with that. But the point is, now that you have got two different Allahs, Allah of the Bible, God of the Bible, Yahweh of the Bible, and Allah of the Quran, and when they don't agree, which one do you go with? That is the question. And that, just like how you said, the Bible's pattern is consistently different. Consistently different, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, in comparison to the Quran. So the challenge for you is, when the entirety of the Bible disagrees with the Quran, my recommendation to you is, you should consider either the Quran to be a completely strange book, having no lineage from the Bible, and therefore coming back to the Bible, or you insist that this is still the last of the books and live in a confused world. That is a suggestion to you. The Bible is different, the Bible's pattern is missing in the Quran, and therefore, Quran ought to be put in a place which is not useful for human salvation. First and foremost, for human salvation, the Quran, you're correct. The Quran does not require human blood for salvation, unlike the Bible. So you are right, it's absolutely different. Okay? The Quran has a concept of forgiveness which means Allah al Ghafur al Rahim has the ability to forgive without killing his own son. Okay, so for example, if you wanted to save someone, you wouldn't push your own son in front of the traffic to save someone, you would go yourself to save that person. So you're right, the Quran doesn't require any middleman, okay, or the blood of any middleman to be shed for the, for the eternal salvation, as you say. Now, with regards to the difference between the Quran and the Bible, yes, of course there is difference. For example, if you read the book of Ezekiel 18, yes, where it clearly says, the father is not accountable for the sins of the son, and the son is not accountable for the sins of the father, there is no mention of any sacrifice in that particular book. In fact, it says the wickedness of the wicked, if they forget their wickedness, and if they ask for God's forgiveness, I'm paraphrasing, and if they ask for God's forgiveness and repentance, then they will, be, they will live. They will have life. There is no mention of any blood sacrifice of an animal, or a goat, or a man, or anything like that. Now, this again is consistent. If you look at the book of Leviticus, when it talks about the sacrifices, it is a kind of something which is not done on purpose, not intentionally. So, in fact, even putting flour on the altar is something acceptable. Not only blood. Now, you wouldn't call flour as blood, would you? You can give things like bread and flour. It is not, for example, if you had murdered someone, you go and sacrifice a goat and you go scot free. No. For intentional sins like murder, like other things, that was capital offense, that was capital punishment, and this was by death, either by stoning or by some other form of death. You cannot go and sacrifice a goat, or the person cannot sacrifice a goat on your behalf. To be forgiven. Another thing you said because the Quran is the last book, it's a photocopy or whatever, and you shouldn't rely on the last book, you should, should be consistent with the previous scriptures. Now, if we use, for example, the most important doctrine of Christianity, i.e., original sin, yes, as the Jewish people, do they believe that the sins are something which is inherited from Adam all the way to the last man? 
They'll tell you no, it is not. They'll tell you other things, how it can be forgiven through forgiveness. For example, they do not believe in the Trinity. Again, the Trinity is a concept which is an invention of the church in the fourth century. You will not find the Trinity advocated by any of the prophets, either the Jewish prophets or the non-Jewish prophets in the Bible. The Quran is consistent with the belief in one God and not a triune God. The consistency remains with the Jewish people to this day because unlike the Christians, they do not believe in a triune God. They do not worship a human being as God like Jesus Christ. They do not believe that you require a human sacrifice for your salvation. So there you go. This is the In fact, in the Old Testament, God rebukes those people who were sacrificing their children by burning them to Baal, the false god, the pagan god. Now this is exactly what the Christians believe. Sacrificing a human for salvation. Because they, the pagans, also believe some sort of salvation by burning their kids in the fire. God rebukes those people in the Old Testament. So it is not consistent, my friend. The problem is essentially muddled together. Plenty of completely different topics. It's one topic. You mention about Trinity, you mention about the fact that the Old Testament doesn't have Trinity. The Old Testament is out and out from the CHD. Old Testament out and out consistently, repeatedly, reveals the Trinity. And so let's, that's a deep argument. That's a very, let's have that as a, as a, as a distinct argument. Now, your point is where I finish my statement. Old Testament, New Testament, Bible's uh, way, of, way of salvation is through repentance. When you go to high school, Sacrifice from human beings and forgiveness from God. So those are three essential ingredients. All three are important. The only point I saw in the last five minutes or so, which is relevant as a follow-up point to what I raised, was your point about Ezekiel. Your point about Ezekiel is a commonly misrepresented portion of scriptures. Very, very commonly misrepresented. So you refer to the portion of scriptures when God says, the soul of the Father, if a man is just that's what is God for the right. So your, so your point from Ezekiel chapter 18 is about the fact that the one who commits a sin is the one who would be held accountable for his sin. What you fail to understand is that is that this wasn't introduced by Ezekiel. Ashim, are you listening? This particular point that the soul that sins would die is not a point which was introduced by Ezekiel. This is the point right from the start. In other words, in, in the book of Leviticus, when someone sins, who is the one who takes the sacrifice and goes to the temple? Can his son do that on behalf of the person who sinned? No! Can a father do that on behalf of the son? No! Can any of these inheritance things work there? No! It is the one who sins who takes up the responsibility to seek a remedy for that sin. That is the template in Leviticus and that is precisely the point which Ezekiel mentions here again. Ezekiel's point is not, we don't need sacrifice anymore. Ezekiel doesn't even use the term sacrifice. His point wasn't, we have done away with sacrifices. His point was rather about who was responsible for seeking for an answer, for seeking for a solution for that sin. When I sin, I am responsible. I am the one who needs to take the turtle doves. I am the one who needs to take all the sacrifices which I need to take to. Not my son, not my father. That's the point. So in other words, you claiming Ezekiel is talking about sacrifices no longer being needed is completely inaccurate, completely uh, uh, inconsistent with scriptural knowledge. Please don't advocate that idea anymore, please. That is one point. And another point you raised, which is also relevant to our conversation, is about the fact that Leviticus mentions the sin offering there as an offering for unintentional sin. 
So what you fail to understand is that it is not alone Leviticus which reveals sin offerings. Sin offerings were revealed a long time before that. Long time before that. Christians, as a matter of fact, see even the sheep which was sacrificed, the lamb which was sacrificed, when Adam had sinned to clothe him, even that was seen as a sin offering. Didn't stop there. You see multiple examples, most crucially and most prominently, which is the foreshadow of the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's death most crucially foreshadows not the Levitical sin offering, although it does that also, but more crucially, it foreshadows the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb. When you read the passage in Exodus about Passover lamb and how the families of Israel would not lose their firstborn sons, you would see no point about intentional or unintentional sin. Nothing to do with that. The only point made there was when God sends his angel of death, he would kill any and every firstborn unless he sees the blood on the lintel. Unless he sees the blood on the lintel, it doesn't matter if you're an Israelite or it doesn't matter if you're an Egyptian. If it is there, your son would be saved. If it is not there, your first son would die. That is the crucial template which Jesus came to fulfill. More crucial than the Levitical sin offering. And this more crucial Passover lamb also deals with intentional sins. It is for all sins. Therefore, very important. Please don't go around claiming sin offerings are only about unintentional sin. If you did that, you would not be faithful to the points I raised to you just now. Okay, so you're saying the points I made earlier were irrelevant. You made a very crucial point in the point before that, that do not go by the Quran which disagrees and is not consistent. I showed you your inconsistently, sorry, your inconsistency by mentioning the, the, uh, the Trinity. And that was a point I made. It wasn't to actually go away from the topic. It is to show you that how incorrect you were and how wrong you were to show that the Muslims have the Quran which is inconsistent to the previous scripture. In fact, the consistency is there with the belief in the Shema, which is only the belief in one God and a Unitarian God, not a Trinitarian God. So that is to show your inconsistency. Secondly, you said it has got nothing to do with the intentional or unintentional. And Ezekiel did not mention anything about sacrifice. You're right, he did not mention anything about sacrifice. So what exactly did Ezekiel mention? mention? Let's read from the Bible itself. It says here, but if a wicked man turns away from all the sins they have committed and keep my decrees and does what is just and right, none of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them. So it's very clear they have to turn away. No mention of sacrifice again, yes? And it says that before that, that they are the ones who sin, sorry, the one who sins is the one who will die. The one who sins is the one who will die. Yes, not Jesus Christ, the one who did not sin. Okay, and then it says, the child will not share the guilt of the parent. Okay, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. Again, its accountability is with the person who sins, not Jesus Christ who is innocent. So now, how is Christianity consistent when the Bible, the Old Testament, which he says is consistent with his faith, unfortunately is consistent with the Islamic faith. Because in the Islamic faith, we believe that the accountability is right. It is actually with the person who commits a sin, not the one who is not with, with the, not the one who is without a sin, like Jesus in this case. And then he's mentioned about nothing to do with intentional and unintentional. Let's go to Leviticus, the, the very book that you quoted, and let's see what he says. It says here in Leviticus chapter 5 verse 15, when a person commits a violation and sins unintentionally, yes, when, a commit, when he commits a sin unintentionally in regard to any of the holy things, he is to bring as a penalty a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value in silver according to the sanctuary according to the sanctuary shekels, the currency of that time it is a guilt offering so now this is talking about the guilt offering yes and it's saying of unintentional things so there is a mention of unintentional things in the book of Leviticus chapter 5 verse 15 and then it goes on to say 
He is to bring to the priest as a guilt offering a ram from the flock, one without defect and one of proper value. In a way, the priest will make atonement for him for the wrong he has committed and intentionally. Yes, and he will be forgiven. He will be forgiven. What? The unintentional sin. Now, there was one point which you did not address. The point about adultery, the point about murder. Can you sacrifice a ram or an animal or a human being in your case and get away and be forgiven for that capital offense, that crime of adultery? Or will it be punished according to the Old Testament by stoning to death? I never said Leviticus doesn't talk about unintentional sins alone. I never said that. Of course it does. I agree with that. But my crucial point was Jesus fulfilled most crucially, much more crucially, the template not in Leviticus. He did that also, I agree. But much more crucially, he fulfilled what was in Passover. Jesus came as the Passover lamb. And there you would not find the intentional versus unintentional sin. Very important. Leviticus talks about unintentional sin. I agree. Please don't go back again there. My point is about Passover. Go to the Passover and find if Moses' sin would be forgiven. Moses killed an Egyptian quite intentionally. Would he be forgiven? If Passover lamb would forgive him, so would Jesus. Because if Moses' killing of the Egyptian would be forgiven through the Passover lamb, and he would go as a man having lost nothing in his family, then Similar to that, in Jesus also, I would go scot-free. That's the point. Don't deal with Leviticus, deal with the Passover lamb. Very important. Now, you mentioned about Shema. You mentioned about Shema and you said it is the Quran which is similar to the Shema doctrine of God. You want to go on that topic? It's up to you. And for, but you were you mentioned that you were unhappy earlier. You mentioned that again, despite my unhappiness, and I need to respond to that. Your point, your point, your point was that Shema is about one God. I agree with that. Unitarian. I said Unitarian. One God. Yes. I agree with that. Unitarian. I'm not going to use the term Unitarian. That's the term you are using. One God. I agree. But that's not the main point of Shema. That's not the main point of Shema. Baal of the Philistines is one God also. Molech. Molech is one God also. Chemosh is one God also. There are all sorts of one gods. There were and there still are all sorts of one gods. The point isn't just choose one of these and you would be fine. That is not the point. The point is if you read the Shema carefully, it says, I am talking about a very particular person. I am Yahweh your God. So it's not about Chemosh being one God. It's not about Molech being one God. And it's not about any other one God worship being approved but it's rather worshipping Yahweh which is approved. I am Yahweh your Elohim who brought you out of Egypt out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Anyone apart from the Yahweh of the Bible ought not to be worshipped. Anyone apart from the Yahweh of the Bible when you worship goes against the Shema and that he repeats in Deuteronomy also. But the same law is repeated. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You choose for yourself if you want to worship the Yahweh 